whom he will, he hardeneth. Father, we are sons of God only because Christ died for our sins. It matters not when you were born, where you were born, or to whom you were born. It only matters that Christ shed his blood for your salvation. Be with Ken as he preaches Christ. Amen. I've entitled this message, The Unveiling of God's Justice and Mercy. And the reason why I've titled it that is because... As sinners, we're born with a veil over the heart, blind, darkened. I can't tell you how many times that I have, in talking to certain people that have attended congregations all their life and quoted from Romans 9, and they'll say, that's in the Bible? It's never been preached. A lot of preachers avoid it because... It gives God all the glory and gives no glory to man in this matter of salvation. And so it takes the Spirit of God, the unveiling by the Spirit of God of this heart for us to see exactly who God is and how He has purposed to save sinners and has saved them by His sovereign purpose and will through the bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, of anybody, the nation of Israel, had the scriptures. It was given to them particularly as a nation, and yet they were blinded. We saw that last time. That's why we begin with verse 6, this particular statement, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Some people, when they read the history of Israel and they see where God raised them up and then destroyed the majority in the desert, some think, well, God failed. No, God has never failed. Man is the one who's the sinner. And here it is very clear as to why Israel, that Paul is writing about here, was in its present condition. Israel had been given the scriptures that the Messiah would come and he did and yet as John wrote he came unto his own, his own received him not you say how did they miss him well they weren't looking for this one and I say the same thing today in congregations where this Bible is read and yet they're not being taught the Christ of the scriptures there's another Jesus that's being preached and the reason why they have not yet seen him for who he is in the scriptures, a lot of people say, well, you can blame the preacher. No, people have the Bible. The problem is the blindness over the heart. Once that veil has been removed, and that's how Paul spoke of his Jewish brethren, the Sabbath day, the scriptures were read every Sabbath day, and yet a veil was over their heart. It takes the spirit of the Lord to teach us. And I know that's the way it was with me. I had read these scriptures ever since a little child, had been trained in them, and even had gone out preaching what I thought to be the truth. And yet it took God to arrest me, show me that the Jesus that I was proclaiming was not the Christ of scripture. And so the veil was removed from my heart. And uh, Yet I had lived so long in that blindness and darkness. So what Paul is showing here in verses 6 through 9 is that God has not failed. Just because there are people that do not believe, even though the Bible still is the number one bestseller in the world as far as books are concerned. Do you know that? More Bibles are ordered and, and people give them as gifts and they have them in their homes and all these things. And yet, how great is there in the number in unbelief that do not believe? Are we to say then that God has failed? Here Paul clearly says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And another way of saying that, as we're going to see here, is God hasn't purposed to save everybody. 
If God had purposed to save everybody, then we'd have to say he's the greatest failure that ever existed because the majority of people do not believe. But what is sure, as we see here, the unveiling of God's justice and mercy, how he reveals his justice satisfied in his son and shows mercy for Christ's sake, it's because there is a remnant to whom he has purposed this and not everybody. And so it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. I know Paul here is anticipating people looking this, at this and thinking that somehow God did fail or somehow he didn't fulfill what he had promised. See, there are preachers today that want to make the gospel a general promise to every single person. If you will just believe it, if you will just accept it, then you can be sure of heaven as your own name. But that's not what the gospel declares. That's not what the word declares. It was never meant for everybody. Now, we're to go out and preach the gospel to all the world. But God has those that he has chosen for whom Christ has come and paid the sin debt and that the spirit will draw. But it's God's work to do and not left up to the individual. One of the greatest lies that has ever been propagated in history is that God loves every single person. And the second greatest lie that has been propagated throughout history, there have been a lot of lies going around, but there's none greater than preachers telling people that Christ died for them. And won't you please believe on him so that his death won't be a failure. That's not God. If you ever hear a preacher talking like that, bring him back here to Romans 9. Not as though... The word of God hath taken none effect. When they're saying God loves everybody, Christ died for everybody, and yet people still don't believe on him, well, what you're saying is that God's word is of none effect. But here is the truth right here. For they are not all Israel which are of Israel. There are a lot of people today that profess to be Christian but they are not all Christian that profess to be Christian. And I've heard preachers say that, but they base it on how a person walks or talks or lives. They say, well, you know, there are a lot of people who profess to be Christian, but when you look at their walk, you look at their talk, uh, there's a lot that aren't Christian. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with it. When you go back and study those that are God's children in Scripture, I dare say most of these you wouldn't even want as part of your congregation. At least these congregations would 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 you take an adulterer and a murderer in and make him a member? Well, that's what David was. You can go right on down through. Abraham, he was the Lord's, and yet he lied. Lied on his wife. Called, him, called her his sister. And people say, well, it was a half-truth. Well, the half-truth is still a lie. And you can go right on down through. No, they are not all Israel They that are of Israel because God, God has not purposed that all that profess to be Israel necessarily are Israel. There is a spiritual Israel that God has purposed to save. And those he has saved by sending his son into this world and paying their sin debt. Here, another way that it's put there in verse 7, which is key. Neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children. See, that's what they're boasting in, and they did that with Christ. We be not in bondage. We be Abraham's seed. And when he told them, well, before Abraham was, he said, I am, that shocked them because he, they knew what he was saying. He was declaring himself to be none other than God himself because that word I am, Jehovah, is a, a name for God that they said they worshipped. And yet when Jehovah stood in front of them in the person of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, they wanted to kill him. So Paul here is saying that because they are the seed of Abraham, 
neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. This is an important point even to make in our day. People boast of having been raised in a Christian home, raised in a Christian family. Well, that's not what makes a Christian. And here in verse 7, Paul lays down the foundation of how it is then that God does save those that are his. He says, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Abraham had a lot of different children, by the way. Over there in the Middle East, all this fighting going on between Ishmael's descendants and, and uh, those of uh, Isaac, the physical descendants. Uh, you know, the fight is on. They can't even get along. But when it says, in Isaac shall thy seed be called, you can put next to that, in Christ shall thy seed be called. That the Lord Jesus Christ should come through that particular seed of Isaac. Remember when the Lord didn't immediately give Abraham and Sarah a seed. That they went, well, Sarah gave Abraham his, her handmaiden. That was what you did back then. Because you had to raise up a seed. And the handmaiden conceived. But, and that's where Ishmael came from. That, all that line of Ishmael. But that wasn't to be the seed. It was to be through what God had promised to Abraham. And that's why he's called the child of the promise. The children of the promise are counted as seed. How is it that we today, if we're the Lord's, are children of the promise? Because the promise of salvation in the Old Testament was accomplished and fulfilled in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the New he is that promised seed that should come. But Paul here is showing that merely being the descendant of Abraham saves no one. And the same can be said today. Being a child in a so-called Christian family saves no one. This is not passed on through blood relationships. In fact, over in John chapter 1, the Apostle John made that very plain in uh, John chapter 1. <clears throat> he says in verse 11, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. His own there referring to that Jewish nation. But, you see, there were many that received him not because they were not of the promised seed. But, as many as received him, and here's where preachers get off track. They say, well, see, you've got, you have to receive him. Receive is to believe. Well, why is it that any do receive him? It's not based on man's will. Here it says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's why any believe. It's because God has given them the authority, the power, to believe on this son. That's the unveiling. And therefore they believe. But don't stop at verse 12. There's no period there. What does verse 13 say? Which were born, not of blood. That's the part right there. Not of. This is not passed on through natural blood. Just because your parents may have been the Lord's doesn't mean that makes you the Lord nor of the will of the flesh. That's important to consider because people say, well, it's based on your free will. Well, apparently you haven't read the scriptures because it says, nor of the will of the flesh. It doesn't come from you. And then when it says, nor of the will of man, this has to do with, you hear people talking about, so-and-so, let's put them on our prayer list. Let's all join together to pray for them. The more that pray, the more likely it is they'll be converted. And so you got this circle of friends, everybody praying. That's the will of man. But the scriptures say plainly, that's not how one is born again. Notice those three words, but of God. And that's really what Paul is declaring here, that if any are the Lord's, it is of God and not of man. Here it says the 
children of promise. There in verse 8, coming back to my text, that is, verse 8, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. How many times does it have to be repeated? And we saw that last time. People still think that somehow that nat national Israel, natural Israel, those are the people of God. Well, underscore it. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So God's word hasn't failed because God still has that promised seed. That's that seed in Christ. In Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And he is that promised seed and those that he has chosen in him. So Paul is showing here that merely being the descendant of Abraham saves no one. I gave the example of Ishmael. He was just as much the son of Abraham as Isaac was. But Ishmael was a son according to the flesh. And Isaac was a son according to the promised. Because as it says here, it's all right here in verse 9 as you continue to read. For this is the word of promise. That at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. That's why he's called the promised seed. And exactly as God declared, so it came to pass. One who was to be the heir of God, according to his purpose and will, would be one who was of the children of promise as much as Isaac was. So any that God has saved is because God has promised that seed to be the Lord's and given them to his son. But Ishmael stands for the children of the flesh. When you get over into Galatians, Paul develops that a, a little further. We won't do that right now, but he likens those Jews to those who were nothing but the, the, the children of Hagar and the works of the flesh. That's not how it is that God saves. It's going to be through the work of his son. So this is what God reveals. And when he does, there's no argument that salvation is of the Lord. And if you're the Lord, you know it had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with your heritage. It had nothing to do with your parents. It had nothing to do with whatever congregation you were raised in. A lot of people hold tenaciously to their denomination. I've had them tell me that I could never leave, you know, my church or my denom denomination. It goes back years. Well, you can walk through a graveyard and see tombstones of people that go back years, but what are they? They're dead. They're, there's no life there. Life is in the sun. And uh, sadly, many of these places that people run to and gather to worship and go to faithfully, get up and get dressed and go, it's nothing but, like Christ said, open sepulchers full of dead men's bones. Thank God if the Lord's unveiled in your heart how it is that he saves and by whom he saves his son. Being a child of the promise, not of works of the flesh, but of the promise, which is Christ. Now here in verses 10 through 13, another example here of the fact that the promise is what is essential and not any natural relationship. He gives the example here of Jacob and Esau. Verse 10, he says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So he's breaking it down even more because up there it said, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. But he's talking about a spiritual seed being called. Why? Because Isaac had two physical sons himself. Just like Abraham had Isaac and Ishmael, now Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. But look what it says here in verse 11. For the children being not yet born, 
neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. And as is it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. That's God's determination right there, even before they were born. One was loved, one was hated. When he says our father Isaac, Paul here is speaking as a Jew, because he was. Even as God's determination between Ishmael and Isaac seems maybe somewhat illogical, but it's even more difficult to understand perhaps why God chose Jacob to be the heir of his covenant salvation instead of Esau. <laughs> even when you look at, here it says it was done even before any did good or evil. If you know the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob was a supplanter, more so than Esau. Jacob was the one that tricked his father to get the blessing, and yet all along it was purposed of God, notice in verse 12, it was said unto her, that is to Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger. Remember when Isaac was going to call his sons in to give his blessing, his heart was set on Esau. And Rebecca knew it, but she knew that the blessing should go to Jacob. And you can condemn her all you want to for dressing up Jacob to feel like Esau, she made even some meat to smell and taste like venison. She was quite the cook because Isaac was blind. And when he went in, he was going to bless Esau. But the Lord had revealed this to Rebekah. And therefore, she did what she did, believing the promise of God that that would be through Jacob. But when you look at the two of them, but here... Specifically, it says not yet being born. When was this decision made by God as to who would be his and who would not? Here Paul is pointing to one matter, and that is God's choice himself. Everybody wants to have a choice. They want to be able to No, this is God's choice. And therefore, it says there in verse 13, Jacob have I loved. That's that love of God whereby he purposed that his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would come into the world and pay Jacob's sin debt. You see, all those in the Old Testament, it wasn't just that God loved these, but it required the Lord Jesus Christ, because of that love, to come and pay their sin debt, that God might be just and justify. And so the purpose of God here, notice how it's put in verse 11, according to election. That's an important word in scripture. Election is not God looking down through time and seeing who would choose him, and so therefore he chooses them. I heard a preacher that said that one time. He said, the election is simple to understand. God casts his vote and the devil casts his vote, and you cast the deciding vote. That was his definition of election. Very popular preacher. Well, he missed it. And if he died believing that, then he died with that veil yet over his heart, only to discover a sovereign, holy God that would cast him into hell, even though he spent his life preaching. It's not a matter of being a preacher how long you preached. But who we preach and how it is that God is pleased to save sinners. Listen to men. Listen to their message. If they're in any way giving glory to man, they're not serving God. I don't care how kind they are. So here Paul makes it plain that this is according, verse 11, to, the, to election. That his will according to election might stand. Not of works, but of him that calleth. Could preach a whole message just on that particular part of the verse. 
we're not to think in any way that God chose Jacob over Esau because he knew their works in advance. Now, if that were the case, then likely he would have chosen Esau because Esau was the more faithful son, if you will. But that's not how it is that God chooses. Notice, not of works. That's one thing you'll find throughout Scripture, not of works. If any thought of man contributing by his works or by his will or by his way, then they don't know God. They're yet in blindness. Unless God reveals in them this truth, they will perish in that belief. Now notice, it is not by our reasoning, it's not by our will, but here it's of him that calleth. We saw already there in Romans 8 that there are those that are named already in the Lamb's book of life. Well, here it is him of him that calleth. In other words, in his time, he does draw them to himself. I know some people try to minimize there where it says in verse 13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. There are even some translations of scripture that translated loved less. That's not what it says. These are strong words. Jacob have I loved. That is with that everlasting love of God that he set upon his elect that he gave to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, even before the world began. And for whom then the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, like it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Why did he send his son into this world? Well, it's to save those that he loved. Not for any merit of their own, but because he loved them. And yet, it's just as strong a word here where he says, Jacob or Esau have I hated. Now, God is not a God of passion in the sense like we are. Somebody says, well, I hate you. Here, his hatred has to do with his total disapproval. And whom God hates, they'll never be approved of God. There are in Scripture vessels of honor and there are vessels of dishonor, all made from the same lump. We're going to see that as we go on here. And that's what it means to be hated, the fact that God would create somebody for another purpose. It's not that he's a hateful God. You think about people that are rebels to God that don't know him and yet live very good lives. They're successful. They have families and children. They raise them. All of these are temporal mercies that the Lord has bestowed on, on these, and yet the one thing they don't have is a love for God. And it's because they have been left to themselves. God's the sovereign judge here. And, and I know we'll get into that next time because these objections are raised, like in verse 20, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? We'll get into those objections the next time. But here, again, it's just to show that this matter of salvation, of the difference between justice and mercy, is in God's hands and not ours. And yet, boy, how this flesh will cause us to wrestle because we think that somehow we can change it. Well, if I can just start living better or behaving myself or making my profession and doing better, all the, that doesn't change who you are. If God has not set his love upon you, then no matter what you do, it's not going to change the fact that you actually are an object of his hatred, a reprobate. And I know people wrestle with that. Well, how do I know if I'm loved of God or not? Christ said, all that the Father has given me, what shall come to me? And him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. When you hear of Christ being set forth in Scripture and his work and what he accomplished, does it draw your heart out to him? 
Well, if it does, then that's a good sign because otherwise you wouldn't care. You would have no interest. Our desire is that God get the glory and the salvation. And so when I hear this, the spirit of the Lord having done a work in my own heart, I give God the glory. Else I would not be even here preaching to you this God. But it's because the veil has been taken off my heart. I read these scriptures and I see you know, what, it, what it says. So that's a blessing when we can say that the Lord has opened my eyes and that we're caused to see nothing in ourselves, but everything in Christ as far as salvation goes. There was a preacher one time that a, had preached from this portion and a woman came up to him afterward and said, I, I just can't understand why God would hate Esau. And the preacher responded and said, well, that's not my difficulty, ma'am. My trouble is to understand how God could even love a Jacobite. And that's how I see it. How could he ever love a kid? I know why God is just to hate sinners. But how is it that he could ever love a sinner? I'll tell you, it's only by his sovereign choice, but it's also only because he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to pay the sin debt. And that's what all gets into here in verse 14. What shall we say then? He's anticipating arguments. He's anticipating people not finding fault with God. And that's really what sinners will do. They'll always rather find fault with God than themselves until God is pleased to do his work of grace. But here, that answer is given. Is there unrighteousness with God? A bunch of people think so. Maybe some even listening to me now thinking, yeah, I don't know if I can believe in that kind of God. Well, I'll tell you, any other kind of God's an idol God. And unless the Lord brings you to bow to him, in his justice and how he shows mercy, you'll die in your sin. Is there unrighteousness with God? It's a simple yes or no answer. <laughs> Sometimes you're trying to pin somebody down and, and you tell them that. Look, it's just a simple yes or no answer. And what are they doing? They're bloviating. They're talking all around it. <laughs> yes or no. Is there unrighteousness with God? Paul answers in the strongest possible manner. He says, certainly not. That's what that word, God forbid, means. God has already, even in the scriptures that these Jews professed to believe, God had already revealed himself as that one that gives mercy to whom he will have mercy. You see that in verse 15? They didn't have books of the Bible. Well, they had the books, but they didn't have the verses and chapters. So you might say, well, why doesn't Paul cite chapter and verse here? All he says is, for he saith to Moses. Well, it's because these verses were put in later, but he's really quoting from Exodus thirty-three nineteen. If you go back there, you'll see that. For he saith to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Period. What part of that don't you understand? When he says, I'll have mercy on whom ever I will have mercy. Remember what mercy is. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. We deserve condemnation. So it's God not giving condemnation where it has been deserved. Grace is really... Him giving us what we don't deserve. That's his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it can never be said that God is not fair in how he manifests his mercy because really all we deserve is judgment and condemnation. And so he makes it plain there in verse 16 pick up with this next time so then it is not of him 
that willeth. Underscore that. He saw not of works, not of him that willeth. But sadly today, the number one message that's being preached is man's will. Man decides. And it's as if you would just take and put a marker through this. Well, I'm not, I don't believe that. It's not of him that willeth. That's what preachers are saying. It's all up to you. But God says, not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. The matter of your zeal. You know, people, preachers trying to get people dedicated and rededicated and serving the Lord is a reason for God to show them favor. But here he says, not of him that runneth. You'll run yourself right into the grave. You'll run yourself right into hell. But of God that showeth mercy. That's the way he saves. It's by his mercy alone. And that mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have the example of Pharaoh that I'll pick up with next time. Beginning with verse 17 and connect that with the rest of the, the chapter. But do you see how plainly the scriptures set it forth? And yet you can make it as plain as you want to to people. But if their eyes are beholden they're, or holden so that they can't see. Guess what? They won't see. They'll immediately try to go to another portion of Scripture and say, well, but over here it says as if Scripture contradicts itself. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. This is the foundation right here. My, my prayer is that the Lord would remove the scales from our eyes. And when he does, guess what? We're going to give God all the glory. Someone asked one time, so what's the right interpretation of Scripture? Well, it's one that gives God all the glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that gives man none of the glory. Whatever the interpretation, I don't, even the whosoever will passages, people want to say, well, it says whosoever will, but it doesn't say whosoever, and the will, it's not of man to will, it's of God. <laughs> so even there you're saying that God has to give the, the willing in order to believe. 